I'm going to talk a lot about data, not so much about protocols. And <coughs> given the fact that I'm an, uh, that most people call me uncle by now, um, I talk about things which came before the shiny new world of having <laughs> everything in REST and, and, and JSON. So um, you can find me on Twitter at, at NodeSensei. I'm currently working as a, a software engineer for IBM. Uh, I did a few crimes in software which our customers have to suffer from, but that's a different story. Um, the public ones are on GitHub. Okay, so before JSON came in, I will probably talk a lot about XML, but uh, like I said, to really, really go back, let's have a look at the very first one that was Edifact. Uh, and these are the two, there's way more of them, so, but uh, uh, this is the two uh, I want to look at today. So Edifact is very, very curious, like I say. So it's the first large scale public API released in 1998. Who was born after 1998? <laughs> okay. <laughs> born after 1998? Yeah. Okay, there you go. And <clears throat> 1998, I, I think I bankrupt my first company already. <laughs> um, so, and what's, what's quite interesting about any fact is that the standard is maintained by the United Nations. So usually you have, like, say, all sorts of standard organization, but that one belongs to the United Nations. That's quite a, quite a particular one. So it's it's officially called UN slash Edifact. This is Electronic Data Interchange for Administration, Commerce, and Trade. That's the that's the thing behind. Um, the interesting thing is, like, say, if you're superhuman, you actually can read it. Uh, but um, other than all the other formats we know it doesn't carry any description in its payload. So uh, that's a payload. No? So if you're superhuman, you look at this and you said, okay, that's very clearly. So somebody flies from Frankfurt to New York and then to Dallas Lagarde. No, no problem, no? <laughs> So um, it has started as this UNA that starts and UNZ, this is end, end of the story. And you see these little single apostrophes. <laughs> This is only for the purpose of readability. When it gets transmitted, there are no new lines in there. So it's one big, big fat st uh, set stream, which makes it a nightmare to process, but makes it ideally to be transmitted over, like say, um, you can actually use Morse code to transmit an Edifact message, very compact. Um, was widespread used in very large organizations, never took off in the middle, because like say, the, the companies who offered Edifact libraries, they said, oh yeah, sure, you can have our libraries. We start <coughs> discussing at $50,000 for a library. And then the consulting fee and the implementation. So it was always a multi-million dollar exercise. So um, it's still around. Uh, there is an XML version of it, which is even more cruel than the, uh, than the pure, pure format. So, but what, what made it very, very special, very, very special, yep, yeah, is that it had uh, tons of document types. And that was, uh, like I say, that laid the groundwork for, for what was coming later on. You see, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. That they didn't pay too much attention to make it elegant in terms of IT, but they made, uh, paid a lot of attention. They said any type of business message could be already ex uh, expressed in any fact. Just to get, up, get you an idea about it. I really, this, I can read this without glasses, but not this one. Okay, so, but let's move a little bit on to XML. Um, XML is um, a descendant of SGML. Uh, what is this? Generalized graphic markup language, uh, or Gruul, uh, even typo in there. Uh, it's actually younger than the first HTML standard by uh, one or five years, depending how you count HTML, they have a little love child XHTML or XTMHTML5. So one of the little headaches when you when you use XML tools to process HTML that they're kind of uh, like Malaysia and Singapore doesn't kind of work, but kind of is the same. Hmm? <laughs> Do I get kicked out of the country now? <laughs> okay, so quick one to the structure. Huh? Um, uh, XML always has to have one that's like Highlander. There is one opening tag and one closing tag. You cannot have my tag and my tag below. It always needs to have a, a, a bracket. 
it has, and this is this is uh, expresses the beauty of it. It has elements. That's the one in the uh, uh, angle bracket, <laughs> and an element can have an attribute. <coughs> and there's a few rules, like say, an element cannot start with XML in its name. Cannot la. Uh, you cannot have spaces. You cannot have special characters. It has to be um, eight bit. It cannot be Unicode. Um, when you put attributes in there. You must, your software must not depend on the sequence of attributes. No? So there's, it's a little bit more restricted when you do JSON. If you want to have uh, kanji characters as a tag name, you just put them in quotes and it's good. XML, that's not the case. Um, they always need to be closed, and if you have an element that has nothing inside, uh, you just close it up with a slash. Um, inside an element, there can be text, another element, or nothing. So that's, that's simply the, the, the ground rules. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, angle brackets is actually quite easy to read. Um, but XML itself, I say, what's the deal, um, comes with a bunch of standards around it. So first is like, say, XLST. That's a transformation language. I can take XML, transform it into other XML. I can take the XML, transform it into HTML. Take the XML, transform it into PDF. If you want to know how to do that, there is a six article series on my blog, step by step, why and wow, and what are the toolings and all that. Um, there is XPass, and there are the XML schemas. <laughs> XPass, that's, that's the, uh, one of the query languages that clearly separates the boys from the men. Because <laughs> when you, so what would you have, let's say we have SQL, we have um, regex, and we have XPass, these are the three ones. If you master them, then you can say, okay, I know about IT. <laughs> and then let's say if you want to be a wizard you understand Perl but Perl is a write once never read language um, the special thing about XPath is that it can traverse the tree structure of an XML document so I can say give me all elements where two elements before that there was a, 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 a red dot in the attribute and I'm not aware of any other query language Maybe GraphQL. Uh, I have not uh, too much experience there. That is capable of relating up and down the stream. In in SQL, you can do like the outer joints and inner joints and all this stuff, but you can't traverse back up and down in your in your own table. So that's that's the pretty cool thing about it. But the <coughs> really interesting thing about XML, uh, it has the capability of namespaces. So um, what does bank mean? Hmm? Uh, in the financial industry, that's where, you, where, where they steal your money. Oh, no, that was government, sorry. Uh, <laughs> in geography, it's the edge between the water and the land. And I say, if you happen to be in the Air Force, which I happen to be uh, at one point of time, that's like, say, how fast do I make a turn? No? Slow bank, fast bank. And since uh, language is so ambiguous, uh, XML introduced the namespaces where I can say uh, financial colon bank geography colon bank, uh, aeronautics colon bank. Huh? And that allows me to merge things together. For instance, if, when you look at the um, ODF specification for open document format, they, mer they had already MathML, markup for and just merged them in. They have similar name tags, but the namespace helps them around. Um, this is a, a bit of a, um, a tree. What have I found on XML schema? So there's so beauty i wsl wsdl sorry uh, which is uh, plumbing what what i use on the wire the document <coughs> schemas there is uh, obviously office there is odf and the so called open xml um, and one of the uh, the format you should know is dita all the uh, the world's engineering documentation like say the manual for the 747 engineers is written in dita which is a is an X, is an XML format for documentation. Huh? Took me quite a while to wrap my head around it. And 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 um, another similar link. So there is, for instance, here on on the uh, <coughs> on Wikipedia. Uh, when you start scrolling, these are all different, different, different schemas where people have uh, a thought about standards. Hopefully incomplete. The next one is you look here. That's the other one. EBXML, that's the successor kind of edifact, um, spiritually, not technically, uh, which has all the schemas around, and you see all the different versions. 
again, what business objects are they? So the big thing about XML is not so much that you have nice curly brackets. I like the differentiator between elements and attributes, but the, there is incredible amount of work went into making uh, clear machine readable languages for different different business domains. And I say, so, which then gives you the idea, I say, oh, if I control my browser and my backend, I don't need all this, that's correct. But you talk to other systems outside, you need to have a very clear understanding and specification uh, what, what's going on there. Okay? Um, so there's a few links. So it, uh, the, um, the presentation is online where you can, can have a look. Um, and since, uh, since yeah, our engineers I put the detail link here in specific. And my graphic broke. <laughs> okay, since my graphic broke, I just show it you live. So um, I personally, uh, I use um, Oxygen, that's a, a graphical editor for, um, for XML. And what you see here is a schema. Well, so when you look at it in a textual version, so this is the XML definition of how an XML file should look like. Well, now it's not Inception. Uh, and what they, uh, the tooling is quite sophisticated. They said, okay, there is an agreement update request. So I say you, like you send to your contractual partner, hey, actually, we need to change something. And it says very clearly, okay, this is all the things. So it has an ID, it has a creation date. Uh, wh when do I expect the re uh, response? Up when is it active? And, and, and. and then I can go ups and drill into uh, what is, uh, okay, expiry is an excess date. That's an, uh, what is the current agreement notifier and I said okay it's a non-empty string and it has some attributes and so you can nicely graphically drill down to do all this. So the tooling is quite mature so there is Oxygen XML, XML <coughs> Spy and a few other tools. Uh, I think Visual Studio has a pretty good schema, graphical schema edi editor as well. Um, I don't use it because I'm mostly Mac and, and Linux. So you see um, it's, it's quite easy to, to work with the stuff. Okay. Um, processing XML. So um, a few things like say, what, what should I use SOAP? Should I use REST? How does XLST transformation look like? This is only for like say that's. Then how do XPath queries answer? How does it work in the programming language? What I found, it's incredibly painful to do that in JavaScript. So like I said, there's a library in Node.js that passes. XML into JSON, <laughs> what's coming out there is pretty crappy. Because well, attributes and elements don't map into JSON definitions that well. Um, what, where, where you actually find a, a natural environment is the, the tools in Java, and I presume in .NET as well, are pretty mature dealing with XML um, when you have your uh, well-defined objects. I'll show you a little bit code later. Um, so open REST. So what's so so everybody does REST today. This is close. We do that over HTTPS. This is great. When the server is down, you can't process. The advantage of SOAP. So I usually explain it. REST is like making a phone call. If the other guy p doesn't pick up, you're stuck. Um, SOAP is basically you you take your payload, you wrap it in an envelope, and then you submit it. All the examples you find when you when you do Stack Overflow uh, are posting a SOAP message to a HTTP endpoint. Uh, if I look at enterprise implementations, they submit it to uh, an MQQ, they send it to SMTP, uh, they have their file system based store on forward, so I FTP <laughs> a SOAP file somewhere and then some other process on the, on the machine picks it up and processes it. So, so, so if you have a, an environment where you're not quite sure whether there's connectivity, SOAP might actually be your better bet because it, it is inherently capable of stored forward, REST is not. Well, so that's one of these little um, things people like to overlook. And SOAP even would work over the RFC 1149 IP over Avian carriers. You're familiar with that one, no? No? You should read it up. <laughs> <laughs> Had been published on the 1st of April. <laughs> OK. Um, Quick code, I'll show you some live example in a second. Uh, it's just about four lines to get XML properly uh, pushed into, uh, pulled into Java. 
So it's very, very straightforward. If, and that's of course, where's the fine, fine little instance? Chup, chup, chup. Uh, okay, that's, that's easy. That's, a, that's an XML document. And you can translate very, very easy from, from your uh, XML into your properties of your, of your Java class. Uh, what we typically use there is, is, a sec uh, is um, Jackson annotations. So I put in my code XML root <coughs> element and XML element, uh, and then I even have um, have four lines to read and write it from the Java object back into uh, huh? your JavaScript guy. You go away. I've been participating in project that involve XML processing and Java. I, I was firmly on non-Java part of the project, and I don't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I did with uh, this one, XML before. We used to process two GB XML files, and MSXML is ridiculous. C++ code of MSXML is not very good. Yeah, everybody when it comes uses, off, uses parsers that are way faster. So I, 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 I wrote my own parser in C for that one. So we changed our parsers like four times until it was somehow bearable with just one megabyte. No, because the problem is that I guess cut, cut it, cut it, cut it. It's yeah, very it simple. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. We start with XML, and what would we what would we do? We take the XML that comes in, put it in a nice memory model, and uh, I say, you have a one giga one gigabyte XML file. You probably need seven or eight gigabyte of memory. Okay. Bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> Huh? And it takes very long time. That's the other problem too. No, <laughs> you, you, you don't do this. You don't do this. So what you do if you have chunkable XML or chunkable JSON, that's that's the same thing, is that you use a uh, use a sex parser. So you you use an event parser and process the stuff as it comes in. Yeah. The guy who wrote the specification for XML XLST, you know, Michael K, he wrote the Saxon parser, which is available in C, which is available in Java. He even has a JavaScript version of that. I said anything once your XML is like say uh, above the five megabyte limit, you don't do DOM anymore. <laughs> this is roughly the same that, thing. That's what I did also. Yeah. Actually. I use a stream processing. Yeah, of course. I bring down eight hours to two seconds to three seconds actually. Exactly. And that's what I did because huh? uh, instead of doing uh, loading in memory, doing the XML yeah. processing, yeah. no, never, yeah. never. Yeah. I don't yeah. touch Java. I see. And the, the, the funny thing is, like, say, what, what a few, uh, most of the people actually don't know is that you can use the SAX parser to write out XML as well. Mm -hmm. You can stream it out quite nicely. There, wasn't, there was a post in, uh, on the Oracle forum I wrote 10 years ago. OK, um, quick one. Did I, does it work? You, oh, it works, yep. So um, that's an example for the simple one. So I have. Um, uh, I have a fruit basket object, and then I put apple durins and grapes in there. I don't know why I did durins in there because I don't like them. Um, and then I, when I want to go and write it out, I simply said, "Get me a uh, a new instance of uh, Jack's B contact, create a marshaller, and then write it out." So how does it know what to write out? Um, is oh, how do I, how do I get back? Ooh. Hey. I, I look at my fruit class, and in the fruit class, yeah, simply I have uh, things like you see XML root element, name is fruit, uh, access a type field, I only want to have fields, and then I, I said, okay, um, if I specify this one, then uh, it takes only the fields I have in there to write out. And then when I, when I run the example, uh, fruit basket, sub, run, Where's my run? Uh, run s, Java application. It goes and writes it out, and I have the fruit basket XML. Here I got the uh, XML, and you see I decided that my name should be an attribute, not an element. And I also wrote it out as JSON. Now you have it in there. And obst is German for fruits. By the way, uh, JSON also has the same fault that you need to read the whole document. Yeah, yeah. Unless you have a J to a even parser for JSON, I guess. But um, that's beyond my knowledge. Well, I say my that's JSON, my JSON is small. If I go big, I use XML. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay? So you see, it's, it's rel in, this example is quite interesting because I say I have safe XML, I use a JXP context, and I have same layer J safe JSON. Um, my favorite one is the, um, I use the JSON library from uh, uh, Google, because I think I say if somebody writes a lot of JSON, that's other guys, they make sure no special character floats in there which shouldn't be in there and all that. And they have, this, this mechanism takes a memory object, but they also have a JSON writer where I can say, add a new element and just pumps it out straight away into a stream so I don't need to build the whole thing in memory first. And um, especially in Java 8 with the stream API, it gets rather uh, snappy. And then like say for old people ditching Java, uh, have a look at WordX, which gives you a, a programming style very close to Node.js. Okay, just to give you a little bit an idea, another little example, um, I <coughs> RDF is a resource description framework that's an XML format. Uh, I downloaded a, a library from uh, a, a file from gutenberg.org. This is where you get all the books that are, that are out of copyright. And then there is a little um, XLST one which says, okay, please translate that for me into um, HTML. And in Banks straight away creates a, a book list. Or I can go and say, okay, oops. Where's my, where's my other one? I have a, a, another thing I said, okay, translate that for me, and it goes and creates a different XML list for me. So, so I can uh, use the same data source, and then with, with a, just a tiny little change, I can go and create XML or HTML, or even a PDF if I want to. PDF is a two-step process. Uh, step one is I take the XML and a style sheet and turn it into XLSFO, and then I take uh, the Apache FOB processor, so that's the only one that is freely available, and turn it into PDF. Um, quite a bit of a headache. Uh, on my blog, you find I find a tool which helps you to design uh, the FOB stuff, so you don't need to write it off memory, because that's that's quite a bit of um, learning curve involved. Okay, so that was then. <coughs> so. So the key takeaway is, like say, between client, uh, between browser and uh, backend, don't bother do something else. Proto pro uh, protocol buffers, JSON, whatever. <coughs> anyway, like say, if you have to transmit four, four megabyte of data, you're either uploading PDF, uh, uploading PowerPoint files, or your <laughs> application does something wrong. Uh, it rules on the backend. The, like I say, you will have to search for a very, very long time to have the richness and, and schemas in, in any other environment, short of maybe uh, 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 EBX, um, sorry, uh, Edifact, to, to have a specific data type. So most of the time, you need to talk to a backend, it will be XML. Um, you want to learn XPass? This is, there's a, whole, a full hour talk on how to do XPass queries with all these things, so I don't torture you with that. Um, it's painful in JavaScript. <laughs> um, there is, uh, this is where the presentation is, actually. So you go to GitHub IO, uh, SDW, little GitHub IO presentations. There are all of them, and then uh, AP Craft is the one for today. And I also have a 60 slide presentation on this link that takes you down the rabbit hole in uh, producing, consuming XML, and all the, the nasty detail lessons I learned along. Questions? Do you use RelaxNG still or just XML schema? Um, I didn't see that much uh, advantage of RelaxNG, mainly because I'm lazy and I use other people's schema, though I don't write my own. Because in yeah, the wars, so I, I in the wars, I think in the wars, I think the XML schema won. For okay. for but XML was better, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but better Max was also better. Yeah, so Probably, like I say, it's the same. Now, I'm not telling the story why better Max lost. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's actually almost equivalent, yeah, yeah. but much more readable. And I used to write yeah. still in LexNG, although XML schema was winning at that time also. Yeah. I remember so when I was working. The anyway, the big yeah. schema, if you want to, to, to write a big schema, I would recommend the editor like Altova, XML Sky, that makes it a diagram. Yeah, 
for big schemas, I we don't think you can just use the source code unless you remember it by heart. It's very we, we just had a look at that. Yeah. So I, I use uh, Oxygen XML because that's cross-platform. Uh, Altova XML Spy is pretty cool XML as well. XML Spy is also, we yeah. used to use that one also, yeah. writing yeah. large schemas basically for passing yeah. the document. But all of these editors, they have this mechanism that said, I take an XML schema, please output a uh, relax NG, uh, take your relax NG and put an XML in there. Okay, any more questions? EBXML is still very popular, actually. Of course it is. Because uh, at least in the US you can build a service like routers so just because of EBXML, because now every company needs to submit their data in EBXML and it is a parsable data. So I can build a Thomson router like service in the US. But I think uh, Hong Kong has just did it. Singapore yet still accept PDF reporting. So I don't know when they will. I, I think it's hard to make a vulnerable document format, and XML is still the only one that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, 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 that's that's one of the interesting uh, questions. I say when you look at at all the the APIs, I say what's what's the ultimate storage format? So any binary format is not future proof. So at the end of the day, you need to have like say so the only binary format that is halfway future proofed is zip. So you go and s take your text format and zip it uh, together so it's small because uh, that's pretty mu uh, pretty well understood. That's what but the, the rest is... Huh? That's what the fight going on right now between protocol buffers and JSON because if you gzip the JSON and send it out, the payload is not very bigger than the protocol buffers actually. The difference is very little, but JSON is bigger. Protocol buffers is not readable. Mm. Yeah, depends on your debugging tool. Yeah, this is true. Okay? You mean that you, you need a schema for, for protocol buffers? So th there is one one other thing. If you want to avoid big documents, you can do it similar like like open document. Okay. So basically, you put you stuff a lot of XML files that cross reference each other into one big zip file, and it, it is pretty robust. Mm. We, we also oh, we did in uh, in a, a few um, CM applications. So they. They send out PDF documents, which eventually might get faxed or might be emailed, and we use the XML header to store the metadata. So you could, like, say, so there was a big fat database which kept all the relations and all the stuff, but all the document-related data was stuffed into the header as an XML. So you could blow the database out of the water by scanning all the individual PDF document, recreate the database. Well, so that was one of the like, like precautionary measures because I knew the, the IT manager then was a little bit stingy on his backup strategy, <laughs> but <laughs> all the PDFs were stored on an optical storage. So um, uh, that saved uh, the company the neck ones by being able to take the individual file and then uh, based on the metadata recreate the, the, the database behind it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much.